The tranquility to be found in a beautiful garden defies the running sands of time. Gardens which have been loved and cared for over hundreds of years have nurtured the soul for countless generations. They take on a myriad of roles, bearing witness to friendship and refinement, drama and passion, laughter and tragedy. The year 1620 saw a new emperor ascend the dragon throne. The 15-year-old Tianqi succeeded his father, who had reigned for less than a month before succumbing to dysentery. The youthful new emperor had few accomplishments to be proud of beyond a great love of carpentry. Inevitably, this would mean that power would fall into other hands. Outside the walls of Suzhou's idyllic gardens, a storm was brewing. As the summer months come on, the sticky, stifling heat can reduce normal mortals to an irritable torpor. However, the wealthy elite of Ming China lived lives of sybaritic ease, and the seasonal service afforded by their gardens was essential to this. Man about town. Wen Zhenhong returns home from taking part in a tea tasting party in one of the city's tea houses. Refined salon gatherings were a preferred way of whiling away the leisurely hours. Wen Zhenhong was from the top rank of Suzhou's gentry society. His great grandfather, Wen Zhengming, was the root of their prestige in that he was considered one of the very greatest scholar painters of the era. Wen Zhenhong asked the maid to boil up some rice water. Fifty grains of rice in two full bowls of water. After it is cooled, it is an ideal food to preserve the lustrous growth of moss from the summer's extremes.
The sponge-like quality of the moss in soaking up the summer rains then held to keep the courtyard cool. The doors and window screens are removed for better air circulation, bringing interior and exterior together. The courtyard plants are fed with a liquid fertilizer made from boiled fish entrails. <laughs> the advancing season brings out a kaleidoscope of features in the garden. The blooming of different flowers, the singing of birds and insects, breezes that rustle the verdant foliage, a continual tickling of the rich palette of pleasure. Some friends come to visit. The maid retrieves the tea leaves placed overnight in the pistils of lotus flowers and boils up a pot of rainwater stored from the depths of winter. This extreme fusion of the seasons creates the perfect balance of taste. Wen's friend, Shen Chunzi, hasn't come for just another tea tasting. He's due to write the preface for a book that Wen Junhong has composed, entitled Superfluous Things. And superfluous things. But what if they're wanted in future and people have forgotten how to use them? I want to record them all to prevent that from happening. Shen uses this exchange in his preface of superfluous things. One of the most famous sites in Suzhou today is the Garden of Cultivation. It was bought by the Wen family in 1620 when it was known as the Physic Garden. The garden is as carefully composed as a painting or poem. Carefully balanced vistas with the grand landscapes of nature conjured up in miniature from rocks and shrubs. The dappled light that falls effortlessly across the whitewashed walls is rarely, if ever, accidental.
Wen Jinhung's book was published in the early 1620s. Superfluous Things contains 12 volumes dealing with everything that a gentleman aspiring to a life of refinement and culture needs to know. It was republished as recently as 2004. Superfluous Things is about daily living, while The Art of Gardening, written by Wen's friend Ji Chung, is a reference book for creating gardens. The two together represent essential knowledge for literati life in the Ming Dynasty. Wen rebuilt his new garden according to these prescriptions. In fact, Wen and Ji were part of a flourishing publishing industry that included authors like Gao Lian and Tu Long. The lifestyle of relaxation and refinement was always couched in contrast to the rigors of an official career. The latter offered honor and respect, the former satisfaction and far greater security. It was a dilemma of choice that had also bothered Wen's illustrious great-grandfather, Wen Zhengming, Wen Zhengming failed the imperial examination ten times. He finally gained appointment as an editorial assistant of the Imperial Academy at the age of 54. But before long, the poisonous nature of court politics drove him to despair. He decided to quit and return to his hometown. Wen Zhengming already enjoyed a reputation as a great artist and had designed the humble administrator's garden, the largest remaining private garden in Suzhou today. For artist, Wen was following a tradition that could be traced back to Wang Wei in the Tang Dynasty, over half a millennium earlier. However, it likewise reflected the rising political problems which confronted the Ming. Tang Bohu was a contemporary of Wen Zhengmi and another one of the four scholars of southern China. The garden he created, the Tang Yin Garden, is quite different from the others and it's also the site of his tomb. Tang was a talented scholar and intellectual from a humble background. Wen Zhengming's father, Wen Lin, was one of his sponsors. However, in an attempt to secure a coveted official post, Tang was accused of bribing the officials running the imperial examinations for an advanced copy of the test. He was imprisoned and then barred from ever having an official career. He returned to Suzhou where his alternative career as an artist subsequently blossomed. Tang has become a legendary figure in Chinese culture as a free-living roguish roustabout. Today, ironically or otherwise, his tomb at the Tang Yin Garden is regarded as the most effective place in South China to seek blessings for a successful career. Millions come to pray for advancement and wealth. Tang 
Yang Bohu's attitude towards the garden is reflected in his verse, picking the peach blossom to sell for wine. His bohemian stance was much admired by later generations, broaching subjects in verse that more respectable scholars would eschew. Tang and Wen remained good friends in life and in art. Their example continues to inspire artists throughout time, both for their achievements and for their integrity. As one of the scions of a long-established gentry family, Wen Zhenhong inherited not just the privileges, but also a network of connections which gave him considerable responsibilities. In 1626, the struggles and intrigues of the court in Beijing arrived on the streets of Suzhou. The feckless young emperor, Tianqi, was increasingly in the hands of his palace eunuchs. Corruption was rife. The eunuchs sought the arrest and execution of the Suzhou official who opposed them. When their agents arrived to carry out these orders, the people of Suzhou turned out to oppose them. Tens of thousands from all classes and backgrounds took to the streets. It fell to Wen Zhenghong to be their spokesman and leader. Massive civil protest angered those in power. It is the only recorded instance of such cross class action during the Ming Dynasty. It also shows Wen Zhenhong's great moral courage. A crackdown followed to intimidate the citizenry. Blood was shed and five deaths were recorded. The troublesome, honest official was captured at the second attempt. Today, a memorial stella commemorates the five martyrs of the protest witnesses to the turbulence beyond Wen's peaceful garden walls. After his death, Wen Zhenhong was memorialized thus by his great-grandson, Gu Ling. He was tall, handsome, and dedicated to his own course. Wherever he went, he always cleaned the windows and tables, swept the floors, and burned incense. With the smell of blood still lingering beyond the walls, can life in the garden still be as sweet? It's said that rain gives birth to grain. The day of grain rain in the Chinese lunar calendar will soon arrive. It's time for people to drink fresh spring tea, enjoy the peony blooms, and sow seeds. In the Wen household, they'll scatter windflower seeds by first cracking the shells with their teeth. The windflower is a plant favored by nature. 
They grow thinly in stones and thickly in soil. They're extremely hard to cultivate. The morning dew on their leaves can be used to moisturize the eyes, and they're therefore highly prized. It's best to plant them in a small yard paved with stones. After it's rained, they become green and fragrant. The maid takes the mud from a swallow's nest and some dried asparagus root. The side of a lotus seed is flattened off. Following a Wen family tradition, the lotus seeds are placed into eggshells and then sealed with a mixture of asparagus and swallow's nest mud. Then one must wait and seek some avian assistance. In about 10 days, the warmth and humidity will germinate the seeds. They'll then grow fast, breaking out of the shells to form an exquisite garden in miniature. A garden is not about size. The Wen's miniature lotus garden was recorded by Shen Fu in his Six Chapters of a Floating Life. Wen describes how to make a novel waterfall in one's own backyard. To make a high waterfall, bamboo sticks of different lengths are used to channel water from the eaves of a building to a small pool dug for the purpose and in which broken rocks have been piled. When it rains, sight and sound of the splashing rainfall are a delight to eye and ear. As in nature, the rainwater will gradually wear the stones smooth and the sound of the waterfall will become more and more refined and harmonious. Wen Jinheng's attention to such minutia is admirably attested to in superfluous things. In his redesign of the physic garden into the garden of cultivation, he was able to give full expression to his considerable talents. As the autumn draws closer and the temperature cools pleasantly, Wen writes, Autumn is the best season to work on calligraphy and painting, then the spring, and lastly, the summer. In 1635, Wen Jianhong turned 50. His book had been in circulation for a dozen years, and it's nine years since the Suzhou Citizens' Revolt. But events were impending, which would drive him out of his garden, 
forever. In the meantime, he works, painting and drawing his creation in all its aspects. The process of working is tiring, each piece laden with emotional intensity. After lunch, Wen likes to repose on a clean bamboo mat under the vines with his hair untied. He jokingly calls himself the Sage of the Bamboo Forest. Wen is also a fan of the opera. Apart from the singing stars, he's also friends with the owners of the best private theatre troupe in Nanjing. Hearing that there's a new show in production called the Riddle of the Spring Lantern, he arrives early to watch it. Darkness has fallen and the show begins. Wen is the only person in the audience. With Li Zicheng's rebel peasant army from Shanxi in the west, nearing the eastern cities, should the riddle of Spring Lantern be seen as a comedy or a tragedy? After the show, a dinner is served. As well as fresh fruit and vegetables, the highlight is fresh crab from Yangcheng Lake. After a few rounds of drinking games, Wen is still pondering the riddle. Wen's host goes to change his clothes for the second time today. Each time, the theatre angel's new robe is the same colour and style, but with a different pattern. Today, it's themed on the lotus. The robe in the morning was decorated with lotus buds. The robe for the afternoon had lotus blossoms, and the evening robe displays dying lotus flowers. The borderline between artistic expression and feckless indulgence had become as thoroughly confounded as the dynasty's grip on power. Wen Zhenhong's years of leisurely retreat ended in 1637. His elder brother, a senior court official, had passed away the previous year, and now Wen had been summoned again to serve. Initially posted to the troubled Shanxi region, his reputation as a talented zither player and calligrapher managed to get him switched to the capital, Beijing. it was a difficult time for Wen to return to the capital. The empire was wobbling on its foundations. The peasant rebels remained undefeated. The Manchus were gaining in strength in the northeast 
and his elder brother had been a well-known supporter of the anti-eunuch faction at court. He must have gazed mournfully on the flowering winter plum trees in the days before his departure. In the depths of winter, the perspicacious householder must oversee another vital arrangement. Place a pot of daffodils alongside a pot of geraniums. A fingered citron is then placed in front. This auspicious seasonal arrangement will invite the heavenly immortals to bless one with good fortune. When Zhen Hong's life of retreat in Suzhou had served another critical purpose for his wider clan. While his elder brother had represented them at court, Wen Zhen Hong was free to remain in Suzhou and cultivate the vital network of local relations on which their standing and influence depended. The summons to Beijing was a game changer as far as that was concerned. His time in the capital did indeed include a spell in prison as a result of his involvement with his late brother's anti-eunuch faction. In 1640, Wen returned to Suzhou on leave. He was tired and dispirited. The dynasty was entering its final death throes. In January 1643, a bungled military operation allowed the Manchus to seize the strategic fortress at Jizhou. Wen had been due to join the Ming army, but had stayed in Suzhou. In April 1644, Li Zicheng's peasant army captured Beijing, and the last emperor of the Ming hanged himself. The bleak news traveled south quickly. Wen wants to visit the humble administrator's garden to see the wisteria planted by his great-grandfather, Wen Zhengming. The Wang family, for whom his great-grandfather had designed the garden, were no longer its owners. After the death of the original owner, his son had lost the garden to the Xu family in a wager. The Wang family lost not just their garden, but soon also their identity as scholars. Since then, the garden has changed hands many times. In 1645, Wen Zhenheng found that the citron tree in the courtyard 
was suddenly unable to produce citrons. The delicacies made from the citron-scented sugar would not be available that year. Beyond his garden wall, the Manchu bannermen were enforcing the rule of their new Qing dynasty. All men were ordered, on pain of death, to shave up to the crown of their heads and wear their hair in a pigtail in the style of their Manchu conquerors. The Manchu had seized power under the pretext of restoring the Ming. Wen would not submit to this nightmare in position. He vowed to preserve his top knot and his integrity. Clutching his book, he then threw himself into the river. He was pulled from the water by his family. Refusing all food and drink, he died six days later. Like many of his class, Wen was determined to die along with the Ming regime. But who now would oversee the feeding of rice water to the moss in his courtyard? In fact, though Wen Jianhong was but mortal, his book, Superfluous Things, and the Garden of Cultivation have transcended time to stay with us until the present day. They reflect an era of style and culture that seems on par with any in history. His aim, as expressed to his friend Shen Chunzi, to prevent people from forgetting, has indeed triumphed over the trials of fate and misfortune. Throughout Chinese history, there have always been people prepared to sacrifice their lives for their belief in integrity. Their example is embedded in the nation's culture from one generation to the next. The Garden of Cultivation remains a haven of refinement where people can go to drink tea and engage in conversation, both serious and playful. Yi 我们的火锅是一个非常好的火锅，我们的火锅是一个非常好的火锅，我们的火锅是一个非常好的火锅，我们的火锅是一个非常好的火锅，我们的火锅是一个非常好的火锅，我们的火锅是一个非常好的火
Suzhou today is a city of many hidden treasures. And the spirit of superfluous things still imbues its streets and alleys, canals and gardens. The Garden of Ecstasy in Wuxi City, about 50 kilometers northwest of Suzhou, once belonged to the descendants of the Song Dynasty poet Qin Guan. The Qin family owned the garden for more than 500 years until the early 1950s. Thereafter, the family was scattered all around the world, but as long as the garden exists, their spiritual home remains intact. Members of the family gather at the garden on April the 5th every year. It's become a new tradition which connects them all to their ancestors. The great gardens are no longer the private retreats of the scholar gentry, whose refined lifestyle and wealth gave birth to them. They're now open to anyone who seeks a retreat into solitude in surroundings of exquisite beauty. Looking at them, it becomes a challenge to imagine how any mortal eye could have devised such arrangements. But those who doubt this possibility need no more than consult Wen Zhenheng's superfluous things. <laughs> 